Is it working? Hey. <laughs> okay, well, good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome back to STEM for Good, our 10th conference. This afternoon, we thought we'd introduce something a little bit different, something that we haven't done before at our previous conferences. So normally we'd have um, poster presenters. As you can see, there's a couple of posters behind you, up on the wall, up on these boards, and they all have QR codes, which you can scan, or well, most of them, the people that are willing to submit, have QR codes where you can go and watch their verbal presentation. Prizes have been given for them, and they'll be announced on the website. So if you head over to events.ysjournal.com at the end of the day, you'll be able to find them. So the thing that's a little bit different this year is obviously since we don't have any actual poster presenters, we thought it would be interesting to bring along some students from a different thing that we've been doing this year. So back in March, we began our partnership with Imperial College's Science Union, and they, like us, have their own science communication competition. We decided that we were going to partner with them for the video category, and students that entered this video category had to submit a three and a half minute video on a chosen topic from four stimuli given by Imperial College. And as part of our partnership, we decided that we were going to give some awards um, for this competition. And the next three people that we've got to come and um, speak to you now have won third, second, and first place, respectively. And we thought they all dem demonstrated in your, um, huge interest for science. We thought you know, they were really passionate about what they were talking about. And as a result of that, we've invited them to all give talks of varying duration, depending on how well they did in the, um, the awards ceremony, respectively. So Cheryl, Nabil, and Alex are all going to be giving um, talks on a wide variety of different STEM topics. We've got a little bit of biology, you know, do you really know you? Um, and also looking into um, astrophysics as well. So without further ado, as I'm sure you've already read um, by what's on the screen, I'd love to welcome Cheryl to talk to you about the gut microbiota brain axis. Are you really just human? So without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Cheryl. What does it feel like to be something not wholly human? What does it mean to share your identity with another organism? Well, I suppose you would know. If I was really looking, there are just as many microbial cells in your body as there are human cells. Trillions of bacteria, fungi, viruses, and archaea cover your outer and inner surfaces. There are more bacteria in your gut than there are stars in the galaxy. Are you really just human? Perhaps we are defined by our human DNA, but advances in gene sequencing reveal a larger picture. There are 10 times more microbial genes in our body than there are human genes. These microbes within us are unique too. People on average share only about 30% of their gut bacteria, and a different community of microbes is found within each of us. We know very little about what they do. They are, in a sense, the dark matter of biology. But all of us rely on the chemicals they produce. So let's take a look. In the large intestine, gut microbes ferment fiber into short chain fatty acids. These are hugely important for regulating the immune system. The brain's resident immune cells, the microglia, do not develop fully without them. The fatty acids cross easily into the brain and reduce inflammation there, which can slow down diseases like Alzheimer's. It also maintains the integrity of the blood-brain barrier, which prevents harmful substances from crossing into the brain. Unlike the short-chain fatty acids, neurotransmitters are too large to cross into the brain, and the brain synthesizes its own. Yet, bacteria in our gut produces 90% of the body's serotonin. So what is it being used for? Whilst the serotonin cannot interact with the brain up here, 
Turns out it's interacting with what's called our second brain, the brain in our gut. The enteric nervous system, as it's called, presides over the entire digestive tract and consists of some 500 million neurons embedded throughout the gut. It's got a hotline to our nervous and central nervous system called the vagus nerve. Serotonin produced by microbes activates the sensory neurons in our gut. They then transmit the signal, signals to the brain via this vagus nerve. This is just one of the ways that microbes communicate with our brain. We experience this as bodily sensations and often emotions. The butterflies in your stomach are indeed bacteria. Sometimes gut microbes may even change your personality altogether. In studies, baby rats raised without microbes have bigger amygdalas, which is associated with heightened stress response and aggression. They become anxious adults and the effects cannot be reversed later. Throughout our life, our gut microbes grow with us. As people get older, the composition of microbes within them also changes. In fact, the greater the change, the better. The more unique and diverse a person's microbiome becomes, the longer they tend to live. The microbiome is there wherever we look. It plays a role in development, in aging, in immunity, and in many psychiatric disorders, including anxiety and depression. This new field studying the microbiome is shaping the, reshaping the way we view ourselves. Our minds, our genes, our bodies, everything we thought defined us seems to be the results of interactions between vastly different organisms. Also, what was previously unknown comes a frightening yet exciting truth. We are not individuals. We are living ecosystems, and there is a world within us. It's new knowledge, the ancient wisdom. No man is an island, entire of itself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for that amazing presentation. It's hard to hard to squeeze that much into just five minutes. Um, apologies to those watching online um, for any technical difficulties that have occurred before the beginning of um, this session. Um, without further ado, I'd like to welcome the second, um, second place winner from our Science Challenge Awards category, Nabil, who will be talking to us about bees. And I know bees might sound like something that's uh, you know, that could be a bit dull, but I'm pretty sure you'll be amazed by what you're about to hear. So without further ado, let's welcome Nabil. Hi, so I thought I would use my time today to um, talk about a project which I did in which I um, investigated uh, the and compared the effectiveness of honeybee and honeybee pollination, uh, insect pollination, um, in comparison to wind pollination, and I used computational fluid dynamics modeling as a tool to do so. So, a basic introduction to the honeybee is that it's a very important organism, um, so much that the Royal Geograf Geographical Society voted it as the most important animal on Earth. And the reason for this is, is that it's the main, um, it's the main pollinator for um, insect pollinated species across the globe, which make up 80% of plants in nature. Um, furthermore, uh, Albert Einstein was even reputed to have said um, that uh, if it disappeared, we only have four more years of life left. Um, however, in the past century, honeybee populations have declined significantly on a global scale. And in previous research, I found this to be um, due to three main reasons, um, being human activity, um, pests, uh, namely the varroa mite, and um, pesticides, uh, namely a, uh, mostly a group called neonicotinoids. And so I wanted to, um, in this project, I want to expand my um, knowledge on this, uh, and by doing so to understand the importance of the honeybee uh, to the agricultural sector um, in a quantitative manner. And so I use computational fluid dynamics CFD modeling as a tool to do so. And this is essentially um, the computational solution of flow field behavior and related phenomena. Um, and the way um, 
essentially achieves this is through solving uh, the conservation equations. This could be the conservation of mass, of energy, um, and so forth. Um, and it solves these uh, in the particular environment that um, the, the models give it. And these are called, as you can see on the bottom right, the Navier-Stokes equations, and essentially solves these um, in an algebraic form in an iterative manner. And so I use three main programs uh, to complete this modeling, the first being ANSYS space claim, uh, which I use to make the geometry and to make the representation um, of an agricultural field, uh, which can be seen on the top right, the, the rectangle there, um, which was exposed to the outer environment, which was this computational domain, the square on the bottom left. And I also um, added uh, the representation of a line of trees um, and two different release points for pollen in the form of bushes. And then I essentially um, broke this down using a fluent mesh model uh, into a discretized representation of the geometry for CFD calculations. Um, and I broke this down into, in my um, research into around 215,000 cells in which each cell or node um, the equations would be solved. And then I also um, added refinement in certain areas um, in which I predicted uh, flow, flow, change, flow behavior change to be greater, which led to more accurate results. And finally, I used physic, uh, Fluent Solver um, to essentially set up the physics of the problem. Um, and as I said previously, to solve the discretized forms of the conservation equations uh, for the fluid flow. Um, yeah. And then I also post-process this information into diagrams, uh, as can be seen on the left, in which I could uh, analyze in my research. And so I investigated a lot of different scenarios. However, these were the main three findings that I took. Um, and the first results was in the comparison of release locations of pollen, um, being the um, edge release of pollen in comparison to the line of trees that I mentioned earlier, and the center release of pollen in comparison to the line of trees. And uh, using isosurface plots, um, I found that um, the edge release, the edge release of pollen um, in comparison to line of trees was much more effective, um, as can be seen in the bottom right, which was the edge release, and you can see the isosurface plot. Essentially, the pollen reaches the edge of the field, leading to more effective pollination. And the reason for this um, was that the line of trees essentially creates um, it creates a wake from the trees, a wake um, in which the in which recirculation zones occur and the pollen is essentially trapped in these uh, zones so it can't travel all the way down the field. And the next uh, comparison um, I investigated was the comparison of upstream wind of 8 meters per second and 6 meters per second normal to the line of trees. And the reason why I chose these values of 8 and 6 was that when I um, analyzed the median wind speed of countries in which wind pollinated crops were found, um, the higher and lower values of this were eight and six. Um, and using concentration contours as a post-process plot, um, which are on the, the two diagrams at the top, uh, the left being eight meters per second and the right being six meters per second, you can once again see that the, um, that the pollen reaches further down the field on the left diagram, the eight meters per second, which essentially leads to more effective pollination. And the reason for this is that um, the, in the six meters per second um, scenario, recirculation zones once again occur, which, which are broader and uh, larger than the recirculation zones in the eight meters per second. And once again, they hinder the pollen from reaching the edge of the field. And finally, um, I investigated the impact of wind direction um, to the line of trees. And I um, used a scenario of, uh, wind, uh, of the wind direction 45 degrees to the trees. And I've, um, in, the left, in the diagram on the left, I've um, represented this in the form of a velocity vector, isosurface, and concentration contour plot. And due to the coanda effect, which is essentially where a jet, a jet fluid flow will attach itself to a solid, uh, the solid being the line of trees, I found that around 25% of the field was blocked from any pollination whatsoever, leading to less effective pollination. And then using these results, you can essentially creates a perfect scenario for um, wind pollination, which can then lead to greater crop yields, which are needed um, in, this, in this period in time. And so first of all, I found that higher wind speeds, through my, through my um, calculations, I found that higher wind speeds uh, led to more effective wind pollination, and therefore continents such as North America, which have higher median wind speeds of eight meters per second and even more, 
um, would lead to more effective pollination. And also I found that um, trees, uh, the presence of trees um, in wind pollinated crop fields uh, led to less effective pollination. And the reason for this was that the wake of, tree, the, wake of the trees um, created recirculation zones, uh, which hindered the pollination from reaching um, the edge of the fields. And therefore, yeah, this was essentially the perfect scenario of wind pollination. And then um, using the uh, CFD scenarios that I discussed previously um, and assumed probabilities, I could use, I could create a simple mathematical model um, for assessing the overall wind pollination performance of the average uh, wind pollinated um, crop field, um, and which I found the value of overall pollination performance to be at around uh, 45%. Um, and further computational fluid dynamic analyses, wind rose data, and studies of terrains could increase this accuracy, could increase the accuracy of this value uh, greatly. And now relating this back to honeybee pollination, um, it's important to know that there is on average one honeybee per square meter of wind pollinated, of insect pollinated crops in the USA, which essentially leads to very high, high um, visitation frequencies of flowers and therefore um, high effectiveness of pollination. Um, next, honeybees have co-evolved with plants over millions of years to function in a near perfect balance. Um, one of the ways uh, in which this is evident is that the nectar that the honeybee forages for is found deep inside the flower, um, which means that when the honeybee essentially ext extracts the nectar from the plant and it essentially goes deep inside the flower to do this, its electrically charged hairs pick up um, pollen grains, which are then hopefully transferred to the stigma of a neighboring plant. Um, and finally, uh, honeybee, um, honeybees have evolved certain communication patterns which can increase the effectiveness of its pollination. Um, one, way, uh, one, one main way in which this happens is the waggle dance, which is essentially where a, a forager, um, which is a honeybee that forages for pollen and nectar, uh, it will come into the hive and tell other, um, and tell other foragers uh, through this waggle dance where the higher concentrations of pollen and nectar sources are which essentially means that more foragers will end up going to um, areas with higher, um, with higher nectar and therefore pollen concentrations, which essentially leads to more effective pollination. And so in this way, we can see that honeybee pollination is extremely organized and structured and has evolved in millions of years to do so. And linking it back to wind pollination, um, the low performance and the essentially random nature uh, of wind pollination proved very revealing, proved very revealing uh, through the prelim preliminary um, CFD calculations that I undertook in comparison to the much more structured and organized honeybee pollination. And therefore, I gave a very rough estimate in my project that honeybee pollination was 50 to 100% uh, more effective than the 46.05% 40, um, value given. Uh, in the mathematical model that I used, and therefore this shows the importance of honeybees to the agricultural to the agricultural sector, and shows that we have to, um, as a as a population, we have to act um, to essentially to protect the honeybee, um, as the as the absence um, of honeybee pollination of this extremely effective form of pollination would would prove to be disastrous for our crop yields. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Nabil, for that really insightful presentation. I feel like I've learned quite a lot. Might have gone you know, a bit beyond my capacity personally, but I'm sure um, with so many people in this room being you know, the best young minds, the best um, STEM students of the future, I'm sure it was more than simple enough to understand. So I'd now like to talk about our first place winner from the Science Challenge Award. So Alex presented us a really interesting video um, with his submission back in June. And I think it's safe to say the topic that he's gonna talk about is um, I think appeals to everyone because it's a bit of, bit of biology, bit of astrophysics, bit of 
physics, maybe even some chemistry thrown in. So it really encompasses this whole idea of STEM technology working together. And something that really um, stayed in our minds after watching the video was his use of um, um, additional production techniques, as well as his use of props, including a leather jacket. I think you'll be safe to say, I think it's safe to say he didn't bring that with him today. So, um, you know, would have been nice, but you know, it's okay. It's okay. If anyone wants to see it, let us see that entry. You're more than welcome to come and, come and ask me or Alex. I'm sure he'd be more than happy to share it with you. So first place winner, um, please give a warm welcome to Alex. Right. Thank you for that introduction, Harry. Imagine you're on a journey through time and innovation, a journey that takes us from the vast reaches of outer space to the intricate landscape of the human brain. Today, we embark on a fascinating exploration of technology's transformative power, where robotics initially designed for outer space ventures found, new mission, found a new mission right here on Earth, within the realm of medicine. In the annals of space history, 1969 emerges as a pivotal juncture where NASA stood on the brink of cosmic history, fresh from the triumph of the Apollo 11 mission, which had etched the first human footprints on the lunar soil, the agency was poised for a transformative leap beyond the iconic lunar landings. NASA's post-Apollo post aspirations initially included the Apollo Extension Program, an idea rooted in leveraging the existing Apollo technology for a range of missions. This program held promise in its intent to extend the reach of human exploration into the cosmos. However, the tide of innovation soon swept the Apollo Extension Program aside, ushering in a, a more audacious vision. NASA had long harbored the dream of a reusable space plane, a vehicle capable of transporting astronauts and cargo to the cosmos and safely returning them back to Earth. This concept, dating back to the 1950s, gained renewed momentum. This vision gave birth to the Space Shuttle Program. NASA embarked on a journey of planning and development culminating in the creation of a remarkable spacecraft that was designed for versatile and reusable space travel, designed to transport astronauts, deploy satellites, conduct scientific research, and accomplish a myriad of, a myriad of tasks in the realm of low Earth orbit. Crucially, NASA recognized the value of international col collaboration in this ambitious endeavor. Building on a history of fruitful cooperation with the Canadian Space Agency, it's a Canadian Space Agency, NASA extended an invitation to Canada to participate in this development. This collaboration not only fortified the bonds between nations, but also played a role in the story of the Space Shuttle. Fast forward to 1981 and the launch of Space Shuttle Columbia. This momentous event marked not only the beginning of the Space Shuttle era, but also the fusion of dreams and innovations that had brought it to life. Columbia soared into the heavens carrying with it the hopes and aspirations of an era eager to explore space in unprecedented ways. The Space Shuttle program had lifted off, and its journey would leave an indelible mark on the tapestry of human space exploration. A crucial challenge awaited NASA, unloading the contents of the Space Shuttle's payload bay, which could weigh up to a staggering 29,000 kilograms. The solution to this problem emerged from the collaborative efforts of two, Canadians, com two Canadian companies DSMA ATCON, known for, for its development of a, ro of a robotic arm capable of loading fuel into a nuclear reactor, and SPAR Aerospace. NASA's strict guidelines for, for the development of what would later become known as the manipulator demanded high dexterity, the ability to handle substantial maximum loads, unparalleled precision, and unwavering reliability, as there are no second chances in space. After an impressive five years of development, a final product resembling a human arm, with two rotating joints at the shoulder, one at the elbow and three at the wrist, was produced. It could lift a remarkable 266,000 kilograms in microgravity, all whilst consuming less electricity than a tea kettle. 
Larkin Cohen, who was leading Spa Aerospace at the time and would, later, and would later become the president of the Canadian Space Agency, fittingly christened this revolutionary device, Canada Arm. This versatile robotic arm quickly became the Swiss Army knife of space technology, capable of performing tasks including assisting astronauts during spacewalks, deploying and capturing satellites, clearing away hazardous ice buildup, and even docking the space shuttle with the Soviet space station Mir. Four duplicates of Canada Arm would be constructed, each allocated to one of the shuttles in NASA's fleet. One of these shuttles would be the Challenger, which would be met with disaster in 1986 when it broke apart just 73 seconds into flight, resulting in the tragic loss of all seven crew members aboard. Despite this devastating setback, Canada Arm continued to be an essential component of the space shuttle program. However, it faced another catastrophic incident in 2003 when the Columbia was destroyed during re-entry due to damage sustained during its launch, once again claiming the lives of seven dedicated astronauts. Following this tragedy, NASA recognized the need for an extender piece on the Canada Arm to, faci to facilitate easier inspection of the shuttle's underside. Unfortunately, these incidents, combined with the mounting costs and an aging shuttle fleet, would eventually lead to the termination of the Space Shuttle Program in 2011, marking the end of Canada Arm in its original form. But the story doesn't end here. In 1984, then President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, unveiled plans for space station freedom, aimed at restoring the US's prominence in space exploration. He extended an invitation to the Canadian Prime Minister to join the program with one condition, Canada would provide a mobile servicing station for Space Station Freedom. The contract for this crucial task would be awarded to our familiar friends back at Spa Aerospace. As the years rolled on, Space Station Freedom mount faced mounting costs and the global landscape underwent dramatic changes. The collapse of the Soviet Union dashed any dreams of a successor to their Space Station Mir. And this reality led to a momentous decision in a bid to share the financial burden and herald in a new era of international collaboration in space exploration, the decision was made to merge the aspirations of space station freedom with Russia's Mir-2 project. The fusion of efforts and resources marked a turning point in the history of space exploration. In 1998, the International Space Station was born. In that very same year back in Canada, something special was happening at Spa Aerospace. They were about to complete the construction of a remarkable piece of technology, a direct descendant of the original Canada Arm. But before they handed it over to NASA, they bestowed it upon a name that carries with it a legacy of precision, reliability, and boundless potential, Canada Arm II. In the annals of medical history, the evolution of neurosurgery stands as a testament to the limitless human pursuit of understanding and conquering the intricacies of the human brain. It is a saga of relentless exploration, unwavering determination, and the ceaseless pursuit of innovation. The ancient Egyptians, in their audacious foray into the realm of cranial surgery, set the stage for what would become a profound odyssey. Motivated by their belief in the mind's power to heal, they embarked upon the daring practice of trepanation the art of opening the skull to, receive, to release perceived ailments. Though the true essence of the brain remained veiled, their bold incisions illuminated a path into uncharted territory. As the centuries rolled on, the Greek physician Hippocrates lent his wisdom to this unfolding narrative. He rejected superstition and embraced empirical observation, laying the foundations for scientific neurosurgery. Though his knowledge was limited by the rudimentary tools of his time, his principles endured as a guiding light. The Middle Ages cast a shadow over progress as superstition and dogma clouded the pursuit of knowledge. Yet, intrepid souls emerged. Renaissance anatomists, notably Andreas Vesalius, ventured to unveil the brain secrets. Through meticulous dissections and intricate illustrations of the, in his magnum opus, De Humani Corporis Fabrica, Vesalius enriched our understanding of the brain structure. The dawn of the modern era saw the emergence of surgical giants such as Sir Victor Horsley and Walter Dandy. Equipped with refined surgical techniques and a commitment to empirical precision, 
they delve deeper into the labyrinth recesses of the brain. Sir Victor Horsley's groundbreaking work in stereotactic surgery allowed for the precise targeting of deep brain structures, transforming the practice of neurosurgery. But it was the 20th century that witnessed the most extraordinary leaps in neurosurgery, with the advent of imaging, microsurgery, and the pioneering work, pioneering work of Wilder Penfield, the neurological cosmos unfolded before our eyes. Penfield, through the use of electrical stimulation during surgery, mapped the brain's functional areas, illuminating the intricate web of neural connections and the elusive homunculus, meaning little men in Latin, that represented the body within the brain. His discoveries revolutionized the treatments of epilepsy and other brain tumors. Now, let's delve into the tran fascinating transformation of Canada Arm technology into the life-saving marvel known as NeuroArm. At first glance, you might wonder what a robotic arm designed for space exploration has to do with new del delicate brain surgery. The answer lies in the remarkable precision and reliability that Canada Arm exhibited during its years in space. When Dr. Garnett Sutherland from the University of Calgary embarked on the mission to develop a surgical robot that could perform brain surgery, he recognized the need for a system that could match the demanding requirements of this delicate task. That's where Canderam's legacy played a pivotal role. Precision and dexterity are paramount when it comes to brain surgery, where the margin for error is incredibly slim. Just as NASA demanded precision and reliability from Canadaram for delicate tasks in space, Sutherland and his team needed the same qualities in the surgical robot. But why do we need a robotic surgical tool like Neuroarm in the first place? The answer lies in the complexity and intricacy of the human brain. When faced with a brain lesion or tumor, every millimeter matters. Surgeons have to navigate within the brain's map and the stakes couldn't be higher. Imagine a patient with a brain lesion. The lesion is not just a physical entity, it is connected to the very functions that makes us human. This is where the image of the operating site comes into play. The lesion may be located in a space so narrow, just about half a fingernail's width across, that it challenges the limits of the, what a human surgeon can achieve. This is the dilemma that NeuroArm was designed to address. By marrying the best of a machine with the executive capacity of a human brain, it extends the capability of surgeons into the micro scale, allowing them to navigate and operate within the brain with the utmost precision. But precision alone isn't enough. The robot had, had to be able to operate within the magnetic field of an MRI machine without disrupting it, which presented unique engineering challenges. To overcome this, ceramic motors were used in its construction, ensuring compatibility with the sensitive imaging equipment. One of the most remarkable features of NeuroArm is the development of a haptic hand controller located in the central console. This controller gave surgeons the ability to not only control the robot, robot's movements, but also to maintain the ability to feel the tool tissue interface during surgery. This haptic feedback enabled surgeons to make real-time adjustments and ensure the utmost accuracy in their procedures. Since its maiden surgery in 2008, performed by Dr. Sutherland himself, NeuroArm has revolutionized, revolutionized neurosurgery. It has operated on over 70 patients, all of whom were previously, previously considered inoperable. However, as we celebrate this incredible achievement, it is imperative that we also acknowledge the ethical considerations that encompass the realm of surgical robots. On one front, we recognize that surgical robots offer the promise of improved patient safety and outcomes. Yet, we must ensure that this technology adva technological advancement does not foster over-reliance among surgeons, striking an ethical balance between robotic assistance and human expertise. Simultaneously, the high, co high initial costs associated with robotic systems challenges, challenges us to address access and affordability concerns, making equitable healthcare, healthcare an, a, 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 an ethical imperative, especially in regions plagued with by healthcare disputes. Additionally, the field of neurosurgery brings forth ethical dilemmas. These considerations arise when patients are subject to procedures led by inadequately trained surgeons, underscoring the importance of comprehensive training and proficiency standards. Furthermore, the transparency and in the informed consent process is an ethical imperative. Patients must fully comprehend the role of robotic systems in their surgery, potential risks, and the extent of the surgeon's control. 
Incorporating the precision, dexterity, and reliability of Canada Arm technology into NeuroArm has truly transformed the landscape of neurosurgery. It is a shining example of how space exploration technology can be repurposed to enhance and save lives right here on Earth, demonstrating the remarkable interplay between different fields of science and the boundless potential of human innovation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Alex, and thank you to, the, to both Cheryl and Nabil for their excellent presentations. We're now going to move on to the a final um, talk or um, kind of call it a presentation. It's, gonna, it's going to be our study in STEM panel. So this, we will normally have a panel on um, our conferences at some point. This is definitely a thing um, pre-COVID. But the whole, one of the mottos for um, Young Scientist Journal is by young scientists for young scientists. So we thought, with it being our 10th conference um, back in the same venue that it was in 2015, we would bring um, some of our student team as well as some other members of the study and STEM community to come and help. Unfortunately, Ishan, one of our um, panelists, um, um, so unfortunately said that he was no longer to able to make it due to personal reasons at about 11 o'clock this morning. So we're really sad that we can't welcome him this time. But we still have four amazing and inspiring panelists that are still um, willing to answer any questions you may have. We've got some, um, you know, an amazing lineup. We've got medical student, um, somebody who's very, um, very into her, into her STEM, so much so that she, um, helps um, advise big, um, almost governmental level organizations on what they can do to improve um, if their STEM outreach and things like that. But before we get into the panel, just uh, a couple of notices from me. You may have noticed inside your um, bags that you received on the way in that there is a feedback form. We'd really appreciate it if you could all take a moment to fill in this feedback form don't have to fill in all the questions and then just drop it in the box on, um, on your way out. You don't have to do it now. You can say, hold on until you've uh, finished the, we finished the panel. I can see everyone, I can see everyone reaching for their, for their bags. That's a good sign. We love, we love feedback. We love making these events even better for you guys. Um, yeah, so a couple, a couple more, um, uh, small things. Um, all of our speakers will be around at the end of the panel and the closing cl brief closing session to answer any questions that you may have in a more informal setting without the pressure of um, asking it in front of a big audience. And um, as well as this, you're more than welcome to browse the um, poster exhibition that we've got in the back of the hall. One final note on housekeeping for the panel. We've got the fabulous Janie, who is our um, chief editor for 2022 and 2023, with the, with the microphone, who will be um, coming round to um, pass it to you to ask any questions that you may have about studying STEM, applying to university, what you're doing, you know, particularly for the younger students in the room, this could prove really helpful. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Josh, Patrick, Amarlene, and Eliana, our study and STEM panel, to end the day. So, welcome to you guys. And I'm just going to go and check all the microphones are working, otherwise, you guys won't be able to hear them. But let's give them all a warm welcome. Can everyone hear me? Is it? Hello? Is that okay? Can everyone hear me? 
Hi, um, my name is Eliana and I am an outreach officer and a content creator for the Young Scientist Journal and I'm your um, chair of your panel today. So I'm going to go along and have everyone introduce themselves, say what they do. But, so, Josh? So hi, I'm Josh. Hi, I'm Josh. I'm head of tech for the Young Scientist Journal. So I manage all of the systems throughout everything we do from websites to back-end uh, article management systems. Hi, I'm Ameline. I'm in my last year. I'm in year 13 and um, I'm studying physics, chemistry, maths and further maths. And I also work with the STEM project as an executive youth STEM director. Hello, um, my name is Patrick. I'm the chief um, academic advisor for the Young Scientist Journal. And then outside of the journal, I'm a fourth year medical student. Okay, so does anyone have any questions or anything they want to know about maybe just the Young Science Journal, about how to get involved, or about anyone's particular areas of interest? Okay, so maybe talk about talk about my, my involvement with the Young Science Journal. So I essentially found out about the Young Science Journal at the Tunbridge Science Conference, which was just under a year ago, I believe, um, at one of the events like this. And then I sort of saw some, I really wanted to publish some of my articles I'd written about various scientific things I had done. So I saw the opening of a content creator. So now sort of once a month or whenever I'm free at this point, um, I write various articles for different things. So the other, we had to like Scientist of the Month, for example, and it was, I can't remember which month it was, but um, the Science of the Month was Leonardo da Vinci, so I wrote an article about him, and then I also get to publish my own articles as well. And more recently, I became part of the outreach team, which has led me to being here. Um, kind of a, like a fluke, really, but I always wanted to like, do that, uh, something like this and get more people involved in science. And so, yeah, I thought it was a great opportunity to do that. Yeah, so I got into the journal from a friend of mine who was the head of production at the time, uh, who also wanted to join in. and. That was about four years ago and I'm still here, so really not that bad. <laughs> it's not a lot of time I, I put into it. It's, it's, it's really rewarding what I do. Uh, we, we manage we, Our team manage all the systems and we get everything up and running and we publish all the articles for the guys. Um, my experience with the journal goes back now. I've not been officially part of the journal, but I've published with the journal. Um, back when I was 16, I did a project um, looking at um, sort of uh, like adverse sexual health behaviours um, and their risks and I got that published within the journal. I then followed the journal for a few years um, and then just this May I was appointed as an academic advisor for the journal and then moving into July um, I'm now the chief academic advisor so I run the team um, who basically conduct some of the final reviews on articles that come through for publication um, and we also help run some essay competitions and things like that. So if any of you guys are looking to get involved in research and, and you know, kickstart that sort of scientific process, um, keep an eye out on the journal website for any like upcoming openings in essay competitions, things like that. Okay, so I know Josh, you do some interesting things with robotics so and like some competitions and so maybe you want to tell people a little bit about that yeah so something i've i've done outside of ysj is a lot of uh, robotics competitions and i i, I learned th about them through ysj articles actually that i've i went to publish and went oh this looks quite interesting i should i should get involved in this um so i've i've uh, been been part of a couple of uh, international artificial intelligence fairs and competitions and uh bits and bobs like that okay we have our first question <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so for any students who want to write an article for the Young Scientist Journal, um, does it can it be a theory-based one, or does it have to be like new, like practical research? Can it be based on other people's research? So, like, how sort of like novel do these ideas have to be to like write an article for the journal? So um, at the moment, in order to write for the um, journal, you'll have to become um, a content creator. Um, but they're fairly flexible with what you can write about. Obviously, like I mentioned, sometimes they'll have something specific to have in mind. But I'd say generally they're very flexible, whether it's 
because I, um, I wrote an article about some research I'd done comparing adaptations of predatory insects using like a scanning electron microscope. So it's things from that to also there's been recently a new development of the first vaccination in bees, which I also wrote an article about. So it's very flexible in what you can do as well. Yeah, so that's, you can do that through our website if you just uh, go to sort of apply and then you can become part of our team or you can go to publish my article and it will you, it will give, take you through the steps to publish your article that you've written and get our team to help you edit it and review it in that way. Do you have a question? I'm thinking specifically for, for Patrick. Obviously, when you were applying for um, med school, what did you do? Um, in the run-up to that application, you know, was there something similar to the journal that you did to help best support your application? Yeah, so um, I just sort of looking around the room, are many people in here applying to medicine or thinking of applying to medicine? Maybe, I don't know. Um, but I, um, I obviously had my involvement within the journal where I published um, that sort of paper. Um, and then alongside that, lots of the other sort of extracurricular activities that I was doing were things like work experience. On top of the work experience, if you're going to go down the route of medicine, I think you need to take something away from that work experience that you can talk about in interviews. So if you are thinking a bit, and this doesn't just apply to medicine, it applies for any subject that you're going to go, go into and could do the work experience for, have a look at some of the core values you need to you know, succeed in that role as a professional um, and where you want to go in your career. And then within that work experience, try to reflect upon the things that you have seen and been involved in. Um, and then if you do that now and start building up that portfolio of reflections now, it will sort of guide you really well in future um, for UCAS applications, when you're writing personal statements, um, and then when you go through to interviews for university degrees and also like job applications. Okay, Abilene, do you want to tell us a bit about, like, I know you want to do engineering. Can you tell us a bit about, like, your love for engineering? Well, um, yeah, I, I do want to um, hopefully go and study uh, mechanical engineering. And I actually got into my love from engineering from research and from reading articles and different publications like the Young Scientist Journal. And I think it's really important to just kind of immerse yourself into as much, you know, literature, lectures, books, podcasts, anything you can find about your subject, just so you can find something, you know, that like twinges your interest that you're really interested in. Like, um, personally, I'm really interested in battery technology. So um, I can go onto Google Scholar, search up some articles, maybe um, publish an article if you're interested in it because it's really important, like, like Patrick said, to start building up um, your reflections and trying to just delve a bit deeper into the subjects you're learning, because not just in school, maybe like outside of the curriculum, which can also help for like personal statement writing in university applications. Thanks. Um, any questions? Yeah. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Christina Astin, I'm one of the co-founders of the journal and I must say it's a real delight to see it still thriving nearly 20 years after we founded it in 2006. Um, and my question really for the panel was, um, and, and this could be to any or all of you, what do you see as the big challenges in science? Uh, I know the conference is subtitled STEM for Good. But what do you think uh, the challenges are that we face um, that are science related? And uh, without trying to sound over grand, to what extent do you think the journal can help to address them? I think one of the problems with science is that it's not necessarily accessible to everyone. And I think the Young Science Journal is a good sort of method of like, you know, sharing knowledge amongst, you know, people our age and young people. And I feel like maybe I guess not everyone is as fortunate as we are to have these opportunities and I think the Young Science Journal is a great way of making it because you have you know you have physical um, magazines you have lots of different outreach places conferences competitions sort of making it as available to everyone not just people who come from like higher incomes but like low-income people all around the country I think that's really important 
I think one of the biggest issues, especially for young people in science, is actually being able to sort of get out there and get their work known and get their publications out there. And that's a massive thing that YHJ helps with. It, it, a lot of people think it's really hard to get your work out there, but sort of with YHJ, it makes it really easy to get your publications known to all throughout the world, everywhere internationally. We've had, we've, you know, people look at all of our stuff. I think um, it's also really important to focus on like um, using STEM to prepare for the future, like dealing with um, you know renewable energy, um, climate change, global warming, and I think especially for like us young people, it's really important to be more aware of these issues and to either do your own research or read other people's research and um, act actively know and see what's going on in the field of STEM and what you can do in the future, which is why like publishing articles and the Young Scientist Journal and reading them can really be beneficial. I think I agree with the rest of the panel in the sense that science isn't always accessible um, to everyone from you know such a, a early stage in the career. And I think the Young Scientist Journal really opens up that door to allow young people to get involved with scientific research and explore their passions in science beyond what's sort of expected within school curriculums. Um, and also, by getting involved with the journal, it sort of gives you that stepping stone to get involved in further research. Um, so I know just from personal experience, having been involved within the Young Scientist Journal, sort of and being published the f five years ago, um, if I now at university mention that to people, they're much more keen to have me involved in part of their project. So if any of you can and are interested in sort of getting involved with us, then it's something that I'd really recommend because it opens up so many doors for you. Uh, I just wanted to add as well, like, I find it really cool. So when I was, I was say when I was growing up, I'm only 17, but um, how, like, the women in STEM and science has improved a lot. And I noticed today, like, how many of our um, speakers were women in science and just looking around the room that, you know, what is it, like, 50% of the girls interested in STEM. I think that's also really important, making it sure that science for the future is diverse and like I'm taking on experiences from everyone because I feel like that's how we're gonna better the future I guess sounds a bit corny but <laughs> yeah, that's a question. um I was just wondering if you had any, any other thoughts on limitations for people to get involved in science so I don't know whether it'd be just their education or anything but if there was any ideas that you had on more inclusion in the scientific community um, and how people view um, certain groups in relation to science. So for example, uh, the social sciences as well, um, how they're viewed in comparison to maybe uh, STEM subjects that people talk about, um, whether there are any differences in how you viewed those. Uh, so if you go on our website, you'll find so many of the, we don't just publish the, the physics, the chemistry, the biology. We, we publish all of the sciences and that's, that's everything from, from every science. And that's, uh, you know, that's also the technology, it's also the engineering, it's also the maths, it's also the arts. And I think the wide range of articles that we publish as YSJ uh, really shows the inclusivity of sort of everyone who's involved with us and it shows sort of from every point of the globe we've had a article from everywhere almost um looking at if i think we've got a map on our site that says where all the articles are from and it is it's chock -a block of everywhere um but it really shows sort of all the inclusivity and in sort of everyone who gets involved with, with us yeah i think it also offers like a certain level of flexibility to not just having to study what's on your curriculum so you'd be like oh i found like i'll say with I'm going to go back to my vaccination with these, but I found that vaccinations and that sort of science really interesting. So I was like, hold on, what else can I do? And rather than just sort of, yes, it's cool to research these things, but sometimes you want the things you look at in your articles have a bit more meaning. So not only can I now say that I like, you know, further expanded on my curriculum, I then also got it published and I got to share my findings and I also entered like a communication competition. It's like those little things that you can just add and like just, I guess, make yourself more well-rounded, I'd say. I've got another question myself. This one's, this one's from Marlene. Obviously, the STEM, the STEM project kind of sounds very broad, but... I'm really intrigued to know, like, 
especially as an executive director, what your role within that organization is and your, how it affects what, um, what happens in the wider community. So could you tell us a bit more about that? Uh, yeah, sure. Well, currently I only got um, my role a few months ago, so I'm still pretty new. But um, what we're really trying to do is similar to what the um, Young Scientist Journal is trying to do. We really just want to have as many people as possible um, be interested in STEM and know about STEM. So a lot of the work we're doing is trying to work with um, like low income communities, um, different schools, different youth organizations, different youth groups, and try and get them interested in different parts of STEM and show them the vast wide range of opportunities that are available because STEM encompasses so much. There's so much to learn. There's so many different areas. Everyone can find out what they're interested in. So um, that's mainly what we're trying to do. Um, so Josh, again, <laughs> uh, you're really, I guess you're really modest with what you do with like technology. So do you want to tell maybe it's pe the people some of the, the cool things you've done? Because I know you've done lots of them. You just... <laughs> <laughs> So some of the stuff we've done through YSJ over the last uh, year and a half, I think. Uh, so we've we've completely redone the website, uh, I think, two times now, um, just to give you a different look or a modern feel. Uh, we uh, custom wrote an entire article management system from scratch. Uh, that was amusing, to say the least. Um, but it's all working now. They were all good. Uh, We've done so many other things with all the other websites we've done, so the events uh, pages and all of the new articles we've had coming in. We've got a massive influx of uh, new articles to publish that are currently sitting on my Notion, ready to go, and I'll be doing those when I get home tonight. Uh, yeah, we've done so many things with the, with the journal, yeah. So we've sort of each of us spoken about like our areas of interest, but Patrick, what's that your business? I guess you, we also know you're doing medicine, but like what in particular about medicine interests you? Um, I think the, the, it's always a difficult question to answer when someone says, why did you study medicine? Um, I think I went into it because for me, it was the right balance between like academia and also being sort of public patient facing. Um, Medicine's like fundamental, it's an academic degree and then it allows you to go and put that academia into practice in the real world, which like many of the other sort of, well, all of the other STEM subjects, engineering, um, for example, um, you can then go and apply your knowledge and your science into the real world and make a difference to people. Um, I think in terms of interests at the moment, I'm in fourth year, so I don't know where I want to go yet. Um, I am keen to go down a route of medical education um, and there's just so many different routes to explore um, but fundamentally the, the key ones are you know the patient facing side of things but then you also have the academic side of things so education and research um, and I hope that with my involvement in the Young Scientist Journal um, I'll be able to sort of help more people get involved um, with that research element. Okay, so before we finish, do we have any final questions about anything science related? Yeah. Um, how do you like manage or organize the journal? As in the team members or as in articles? So mainly we, so we have uh, a community discord, which has everyone uh, team members and otherwise everyone else on and we have a, a team discord um, with millions of channels and, and everyone talks on that and we have cross departments so we've got uh, all of our departments with heads and executives for each department and then we've got team leads for everything so for any project we have we'll have a team lead on that project along with the uh, executive and the head of department um, so for things like articles, it'll go through the whole system of um, it will get reviewed and initially then it will go through the stages with the junior editors to um, review it and edit it with the author. And then it will go through with the senior editor to check it over and it gets sent over to the production department where we, we publish it for the world to see. 
also we we try and have like um because obviously there's only so much you can do over discord so we have meetings I think once a month like heads of department just so everyone knows where they're at and they give updates as well and i think i'm not sure if it's on the website yet but um there's like a little it's like a family tree of like how everything connects and like different roles and also different available roles which um i think you can find the available roles under on the website under join us i believe and then it will show you all available roles but that there's quite a, a couple of roles available now if anyone's interested but if you keep an eye out if there's something particular before it's always being updated as new roles come about Thanks. It was just another final question about studying sciences. Um, so for anyone who's in maybe year 11 and choosing A-levels or in year 13 and thinking about degree subjects, um, you know, science doesn't always get an easy press, especially my subject, which is physics. <laughs> it suffers from quite a bad press uh, and it's sometimes perceived as quite difficult, a difficult option. Um, what advice would you give somebody who's deciding whether or not to choose science at A-level or degree? Do it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, Patrick, do you want to talk about it from like a degree perspective? Yeah, um, so I guess the, the further up the ranks you go with studying, the more you sort of really need to want to do it. Um, and I think people... If you've got that drive to do it, then you should be getting involved in the scientific research um, that you can. Um, I think going back to sort of GCSE, I think it's really important for everyone to have the sort of core teaching in science. Um, for me, it wasn't something that I realized I was interested in until I went to secondary school. Um, so it was my teachers and the classes around me that inspired me to sort of take on science and take science into a career um and then i'd just say it, it if you like it and that's what you want to do do it don't don't let anything hold you back um from doing it and, and any of the sort of boundaries that we spoke about earlier which hopefully we're we're sort of managing to bring down now um i'd just say get involved yeah so don't get me wrong it's, it's not necessarily easy but it's very rewarding just make sure you balance like the academic side and, and things you do for fun as well so don't let those things slip just because you've got a heavy workload so i think that concludes our panel that's all we have time for today so if you want to find out anything else about the young science journal check out our website and check out job applications if you have any questions that you want to ask us separately feel free to find us and ask us <laughs>just to wrap up really quickly a um, huge thank you to our panel and huge thank you to all the people that spoke um, and interacted and played a part today um, which hopefully you found interesting hopefully there are bits of it that for you particularly went that's actually something I'm really interested in I want to learn more about and want to take that further um, so yeah thank you all so so much for coming do stay and chat to any of our speakers or our students or anyone that's been involved today um, and you know talk to them find out more so on and so forth um, but absolutely lovely seeing you. I should say a special thank you to Harry, who's done so much to put this event on. So I think he deserves a round of applause at the end. Thank you all so much and safe travels. Thank you.